Hi, my name is Jim Karkoff. Like many of you watching this show, I too have runaway enthusiasm for aviation and for aircraft. Recently, I found myself with both the opportunity and the privilege to take a long overdue introspective look at one of the world's truly great classic light airplanes. This show deals with that airplane, the incredibly capable yet simple flying phenomenon, the Piper Super Cub. I don't know if the air shook when aeronautical genius C.G. Taylor made the acquaintance of oil magnate and businessman William T. Piper, but it should have, because the results of their getting together, the Piper Aircraft Corporation, was one of the most significant happenings in the history of general aviation in this country. While the relationship between Taylor and Piper was relatively short-lived, the company they founded ultimately produced in 1937, with substantial design input and influence from Chief Engineer Walter Jaminou, the famous Piper J3 Cub. This is a model of the J3 Cub, with the J standing for Chief Engineer Jaminou. The word Cub became such a famous generic name that it has been applied by the average non-flying layman to describe just about every light plane passing overhead. To say that the J-3 became a benchmark aircraft is, like the airplane itself, a classic understatement. Relative to the subject of this show, however, the J-3 provided the basic configuration, the classic Cub look, which over time has evolved from that first low-power J-3 to the final version 150 horsepower PA-18 Super Cub, or the PA-18A Super Cub, as it is known in its agricultural version. The famous Piper Works at Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, turned out the first flapless 90 horsepower version of the Super Cub in 1951. The people that built the Super Cub and the company that sold it breathed life into what has become much more than just another aircraft. The Super Cub is a happening with tubing, fabric, aluminum, welded, glued, and screwed together on the sweet spot to create an aircraft that is larger than life, an aircraft whose whole is truly greater than the sum of its parts. Sit back and enjoy this show, entitled simply, Super Cubs. The Piper Super Cub has for years been the personalized workhorse for thousands of individuals who required a small, high-performance aircraft which would lend itself to the specialized needs of pilots who demanded what only the Super Cub could deliver. Over the years, there have been people who had visions of what this outstanding aircraft could achieve when enhanced with their ideas and improvements. One of these people is F. Atley Dodge of Anchorage, Alaska. With over 51 years of experience in the aviation field, which began in the Army Air Corps during World War II and continued with the famed Flying Tigers after the war, and then on to a career with Western Airlines, it is no wonder that Atley Dodge is regarded among his peers as an aviation guru. I've been on this hill for 36 years. 36 years, and specializing in the Super Cub most of that time? Most of the time, yeah. What was the reason you zeroed in on the Cub? Money. Money? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm primarily a sheet metal man, and uh, although I hold both licenses, and uh, I decided that I wanted to go back into sheet metal, but didn't have the money. I see. Took a lot more equipment than I could afford, so. So we're talking about lack of money as a reason you got into the Super Cub business. That's Atlee right. Dodge is considered by many today to be one of the key contributors to the advanced performance and increased capabilities which the Super Cub possesses. F. Atlee Dodge is known throughout Alaska and the entire aviation world as Mr. Cub. His relationship with the Super Cub has been long-term and successful and has seen a number of designed and engineered modifications for an aircraft that Atlee refers to as simply a good airplane. Mm -hmm. Well, we have uh, displayed here on the, on the lawn uh, a wide array of uh, these uh, enhancements and uh, parts, Super Cub parts that you make. Uh, can you tell us about some of these? Yeah. This one here, this is a headliner. Uh, it goes in the Super Cub. This we've had out for a number of years. Uh, this fits in around the window, the side window, and uh, it's pretty simple to put in. We always tell everybody they can have their wife put this one in. What does it accomplish? It gives you more headroom, and it gets rid of that cloth up here, particularly when you're hauling freight or mm -hmm. hunting. You throw a moose quarter back there, and the leg goes through the headliner. It doesn't go through this one. Oh, I can. Yeah, that's. A, I think that's a pretty good idea not to have that particular problem. 
Well, I've got an idea what this is, Natalie. Are these the famous Dodge Long Range gas tanks? Yeah, this is, uh, this is our 30 and a half gallon tank that goes in the Super Cub. And uh, it's pretty well constructed. It's got, we have two baffles in it. Two and, baffles. Huh? And, uh, and then there's stiffeners between each baffle. And uh, we've changed the filler neck from a flush cap to a raised cap, which I think is a better deal. Uh, you can have a choice of electric sending units or for sight gauges. Either, oh, either, either or, an mm -hmm. option. Either way. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, it's... This requires a yeah. two bays in the wing to accommodate this tank. About, about a bay and a half. About a bay and a half. About a bay and a half. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, of course, these are our... You're pretty float. proud of these, aren't you? Yeah, these are our float fittings. These are welded on. Nice thing about this, when you put them on, putting the floats on, in the springtime, it always lines up. You can't get it out, so it's not going to do any damage to anything. I see. And those are <laughs> obviously a permanent installation at the time of rebuild. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a good idea. Well, you can do it. If a good TIG welder won't have to remove much fabric to put these on. OK. And then, of course, we had those safety cables down there that. That's an important thing. Let's take a look at those. Yeah. Now, these, these, uh, these go on the gear. From, from right here up to here, which would be behind here, see? And, uh, and then up the top, we have these. And uh, they're made from quarter-inch cable and stainless steel fittings. And the purpose of which is to... Uh... Well, if, if any of this stuff breaks here, any of this breaks, these will catch it. And keep their, save the prop, basically. Yeah. If, if they weren't on there and you broke any of these, you would probably get the whole top deck assembly, the wing, the struts, and uh, be pretty expensive rebuild. Well, this is a pretty inexpensive uh, safety precaution yeah. in light of all the potential damage that could be done. Yeah, it's pretty good insurance, really. Well, Lately, we're at the point where we're down to one of your skis. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, this is... Uh, this is our ski. It's a 2,500 ski. It should be a little higher rated, but we're just too lazy. And uh, it has a plastic bottom. Uh, it's actually a quarter inch of plastic. For the purposes of which are to uh, keep it from freezing, keep down, freezing down, and it's slicker. I noticed some pretty sharp edges here as well. Yeah. Yep. They're, they're good skis. They're strong, very strong skis. Strongest one on the market. There's 36 pieces of ash laid in here. And then there's two layers of double A marine. And then, of course, this pedestal is made out of 4130 tubing. And we use a nylatron bushing in it. Come again on that bushing, nylatron? It's a nylatron. It's, a, right. it's a nylon type material. It's made for bearings. It's self lubricating. In cold weather as well, obviously. Yeah. And then <laughs> they comes with the rigging for whatever airplane you're buying it for. And we use springs instead of bungee cords. Uh, we've been, we have several different springs. Uh, the bungee cords uh, lose their elasticity, I guess, in cold weather. Is that the reason for that? Oh, they do. Yeah. They do. It's a nice little touch here. I see you've, uh, when this thing's installed, the axle course goes through here, and there, uh, with snow on top of the stanchion, it's pretty slippery, and I, I suspicion that this yeah. non-skid material is yeah, for the purpose of keeping you breaking your neck. If you... Yeah, this is non-skid on here, too. Oh, great touch. Yeah. These are quite a skis. What are, what's the weight of these, Adley? Well, they're 15 inches wide and 72 inches long, and they weigh about 44 pounds. Uh, most all your skis in that category are about the same weight. About the same weight. Mm -hmm. Need to be about that same weight to give you the strength. Holder yeah. of multiple supplemental type certificates for Super Cub replacement parts and modifications, Atlee Dodge and Enhanced Utility Super Cubs are synonymous. Colorful, opinionated, and revered, F. Atlee Dodge in the Super Cub world is the final word. Okay. Thanks very much, Atlee. I appreciate it. After visiting with Atlee Dodge, it became readily apparent why the aviation community refers to him as Mr. Cub. In addition to the many Super Cub enhancements and modifications which come out of his shop, manufactured incidentally to benchmark standards for such efforts within the trade, he possesses encyclopedic knowledge of the innards of the Super Cub. This knowledge, and as it is applied in the field, help keep the efficiency of the old Super Cub at a modern day 
One of the improvements that resulted in a quantum leap forward in regard to smoothness and reduced takeoff rolls has been the development of a longer, specially designed propeller. Several people have had considerable input in this area of designing a prop specifically for the Super Cub. However, Master Cub mechanic Roger Bohr was on the ground floor of development in this area. Roger was one of the few who realized the importance of such a prop and did something about it. And what it did, now uh, you see normally you'll have a, a, a shorter prop. This prop is, is 82 inches long. 82. Now the original prop, it belongs in that airplane, like this one right down behind you, is a 74 inch prop. And if you'll notice a difference in this prop, you'll, you'll you take it out here, this prop is like grabbing a, a, an old board. This prop is, is very flexible. And the reason for that is to have the prop, when, when at, at uh, full RPM, is to have the prop to kind of reach forward, which in, t in essence changes the pitch a little bit on it. Okay. And as it comes back, as, you, as the airplane catches up with it, you know, after, after the in uh, initial thrust, it, it uh, flattens out and, gets, and gives you, your, or not flattens, but fattens up, and gives you a, a fairly good cruise. Now, it's kind of a compromise. It's kind of a compromise. All fixed pitch props are a compromise. There's no way in the world that you can have a fixed pitch prop that's optimum. This one is optimum on takeoff and climb. This prop, at the same RPM as, as the Sensage 52 pitch, pulls an inch and a half less manifold pressure. Wow. Consequently, it pulls just approximately a, a gallon and a half an hour less gas. Now, this isn't something that I ran test on to prove. I've had several of my customers come out here and start telling me about that. The first one, I almost called him a liar. And then uh, the other ones kept coming telling me the same thing. And the prop, as you know, is, uh, is very flexible. That is uh, part of its inherent design. That's, design that's part of the inherent design, with yeah. the way it was designed to be flexible. And, and as such, it, it takes a lot of the vibration out of the, out of the, out of the propeller. The enlarged disc area and the braking effect inherent in this propeller arc provide significant advantages in low-speed approaches and short landings. It's been a while since I've figured it out, but it seems to me it's about 1,250 square inches more disc area. And I had a, a few of the, the, the amateurs, amateur pilots that right. I sold airplane, I sold props to, came back and boy, they were, they were kind of hot. They said they were having a hard time making the runways. You know, they're, they're used to what the instructor told them. When you come to this point, you chop your throttle, you go out so far, you come over, you come back in again and land. Right. And, and you don't touch your throttle until you hit the ground. Circuits and bumps. Yeah. So uh, they, they would do that, and it, it'd be landing over here someplace instead of here where they belonged. And so we, 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 I went out and ran a couple of tests on it, and sure enough, that's the way it worked. I said, well, and now if you learn to fly, you'll learn to use your throttle. Okay, carry this thing a little bit further. Don't go by what you were instructed at, the, uh, at your schools. Go buy your common sense. And, uh, and the bush piles, they all liked that because they'd come in over trees. They, they, had to use to, they used to have to sit up in a steep slip to get over these trees. Now they could bring it right on over and land. And usually, usually this prop is about 2450 is what they, they allow for static RPM, as I, as I remember my, my papers, which I looked at for quite a few years. But uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 as I say, they lose about three miles an hour, maybe four or five, according to have the tendency to over pitch their props okay if you got a 52 it might be 52 and a half under pitches under pitch and if you get them both perfect there's hardly any loss at all oh i see but, but if you uh if you get them uh like they normally come out you'll lose i say three I'll maybe four or five miles an hour but but besides because of the fact you're pulling less power out of the engine at the same rpm and you're uh, burning less fuel, most of the guys will push up 50 to 100 RPM more, they get the same speed out, and they're still burning less gas than they were. Just crank them up to despite the pitching. Yeah, just, right. just when, they, when they, the thing sounds right, you leave it there. And the, the prop is much quieter in the cockpit and outside the cockpit than the standard one is, than the standard prop. So it throws a high frequency resonance outside the, uh, the area, the That's theoretical right. area? And also they find out that at low speeds, you have a little bit better aileron control. And the reason for this, wow. the sensitive prop has a tendency on, on the vortice, comes off the prop, comes in, and then start out, and it'll catch about two-thirds of flaps. I see. The, the one here comes off and goes out and catches about the first, uh, up to about the first hinge of the aileron, which gives you a, 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 little, real, extra, a, real extra, help there, huh? a little help 
Because, you know, a, a Super Cub is not an aileron airplane. No, they, it's not. It's a rudder airplane. It's a rudder airplane. Right. You, lose, you, you lose a wing, you, you don't worry about that stick. You just kick the rudder over and bring it back up again. Yeah, you're fine. The hours spent with Roger Bohr offered not only a profile on the performance-enhancing long Super Cub prop, but also provided precious insight into the aviation scene in Alaska. Certainly colorful, always ready with an anecdote. Roger Bohr, part of the old guard and a Super Cub man. Others in the modification field have contributed to the longevity and continued use of the Super Cub by offering such major componentry as complete fuselage replacement. Built entirely of stronger 4130 chromoly tubing and welded in precision master fixtures, this legal fuselage transplant can expand infinitely the lifespan of one of the most practical and unique aircraft to ever lift its nose skyward. These assemblies carry full parts manufacturing authorization from the Federal Aviation Administration. J.E. Soares of Rocky Mountain Airframe in Belgrade, Montana, is responsible for the construction and distribution of these state-of-the-art cub replacement fuselages. Rocky Mountain Airframe is a quality source that helps return old Super Cubs to the air. Stronger, safer, better. Univair Aircraft Corporation is a firm who has definitely found a need and has filled it, serving the needs of the light aircraft industry. Their manufacturing efforts, in some cases, provide the only source of part support for some designs. Accommodating and professional, they are a fine example of American light industry at work, while providing a strong boost for the future of the Super Cub. The Univair Aircraft Corporation was and is a well-known firm, which early on realized the importance and demand for part support for a whole range of classic light aircraft. Founded in 1946, Univair today continues a legacy of FAA-approved PMA parts manufacturing that, among other things, is a major key to the continued pliable longevity of the Super Cub. Univair manufactures fully 90% of the structural parts required on the PA-18 in its several versions, including such diverse assemblies as wing parts, complete wing assemblies, tail surfaces, cowlings, wing struts and tail brace wires, along with a prolific number of smaller parts and components that make up the Super Cub's character. Though again with the Super Cub, the whole is yet greater than the sum of the parts. Univair, with its parts manual and catalog being simply standard operating procedure for Cub rebuilders, addresses a market that includes all 50 states and which is international in scope wherever the venerable Super Cub has found a home. Steve Dyer, president of Univair and son of company founder J.E. Eddie Dyer, presides over the manufacturing and marketing process that, in many instances, is truly the lifeblood for several classic designs. Not surprisingly, the Piper Super Cub is the single active aircraft for Univair's FAA PMA market. In-house manufacturing does, of course, require sophisticated machinery and subsequent close final inspection. How often does one see a unique machine called a Hufford stretch wrap as it smoothly pulls the channel around into a curve to form a Super Cub's rear D-shaped windows? What about this sophisticated optical comparator inspecting heavy-duty 5 8 inch strut forks? One part of a huge warehouse indicates an ample supply of both original Piper ribs and Univair stamped ribs. Depending on horsepower, it takes from 13 to 15 ribs per wing to effect a complete rebuild. A production run of Super Cub cowls, struts, landing gears, and replacement tail sections are inspected before stocking and subsequent shipping. With the improvements today that are available for the Super Cub, it would stand to reason that discussions and, yes, even arguments would arise about how one Super Cub would perform against another Super Cub, or even how the Super Cub would stand up against other light, modified Bush-type aircraft. Consequently, it occurred to the Copper River Basin Lions Club to devise a competition to answer these questions. What better place to settle these matters than in the controlled environment of class competition? 
In Glen Allen, Alaska, pilots annually converge on the Golcana Air Show, where a unique and different competition has evolved. Pilot ability and aircraft capabilities are tested under controlled conditions and within a festive atmosphere. However, much attention is given to safety. The bottom line is how quickly can one break the grip of Earth's gravity and become airborne. In like fashion, pilot skills and knowledge about the capabilities of their aircraft are further challenged as they swing around in a pattern for an attempt at a short field landing, while in head-to-head, -head, or as it were, wing-to-wing -wing competition with other airplanes in their class. The contest was spirited and lively. Spectators rooted for their favorites. Pilots pushed their performance envelopes, but did so within the parameters of prudent, safe operation. Volcana's Air Show is a fun event, and the Copper River Basin Lions Club, in cooperation with the FAA, implemented strong safety regulations to help preclude any mishaps. Some competitors brought highly tuned and truly modified competition aircraft to the event, while most others brought the airplane they fly every day in their various endeavors as bush pilots. In this year's event, harsh en route weather prevented the arrival of many of the more modified Super Cubs. The winner in the Super Cub category was a working man in a working cub. Basically unmodified, he used sharp piloting skills, honed daily as a working bush pilot to carry him to the top spot. The gentleman here to my right is Chuck McMahon, who won the short field takeoff contest here at uh, the Gulcan Air Show yesterday. Chuck, you, you looked pretty tough out there yesterday. No comment on that, I guess. What was it that, probably what did distance? look tough. <laughs> well, I was pretty amazed. That was awfully short. What was the, yeah. your distance? I think it was 60 feet. That's, that's incredible. This is, a, this is not a modified cub either. This is a straight no, working. It's, it's pretty straight. It's kind of nice to, usually they got uh, modified cubs entered in this and they put us all together. So it's kind of nice to just compete against other uh, stock cubs, you know. That is the case. I guess uh, yesterday everybody was in the competition uh, were, were guys like yourself, uh, outfitters and bush pilots that came together and really didn't do anything other than, I don't think you, some of these guys didn't even drain any gas out. They just went out there and, and had at it against each other. Yeah, yeah, well, Lynn, he's draining gas today, I see, but but he was, you know, we've left our batteries in and left them pretty, pretty stock. Chuck, I see you've got the big tires. Those are what, 30 inch? Right, uh-huh. The other modifications inherent other than 30 inch tires are what? I guess the big uh, prop. The here. big prop, yeah, it's an extra long prop. Other than that, it's, it's stock, you know, there's, not much to do, it has This looks from the interior, I can see over the shoulder. The folks <laughs> are watching the show cam, but it looks like that thing's been used. Uh... Yeah, my wife was after me last year to put a new interior in, so I did, and that's what it looks like this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I can, I can attest, I can, you can tell your wife that you've retained some of the local color in there. Yeah, yeah there's Chuck, a little red left. I want to thank you for taking the time here. I know that you're going to be participating in the second half of this uh, Bush Challenge, I guess, this afternoon, and uh, yeah. I'd like yeah. to wish you luck. Okay, thanks a lot. Good luck. Okay. The history of bush aviation is rife with hangar talk of airplanes and legendary pilots. A predecessor of the likes of Chuck McMahon from another earlier era is bush flying ace Jack Wilson. Jack's deep military background led to a post-war vocation that took him to the far corners of Alaskan aviation. 
It's 150 horse down here, but up there it's a hell of a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I would go in flying into an uphill slope and land at full throttle and get over the top and head it downhill again so that I could get moving again. Oh, I see. And that's all there was to it, really. Jack's innovative use of the Super Cub led to establishing high-altitude airstrips, which served as staging areas from which hunters could backpack deep into the mountains. This greater access resulted in the acquisition of the largest mountain doll ram ever taken, a world record. I took this Harry Swank hunting for a number of years and uh, actually kind of taught him how to hunt sheep. And then uh, finally I sicked him on this big ram that we had known of for uh, two or three years and that we had hunted and we had looked at very closely and I knew it was a tremendous ram. And Harry, while he was waiting for me, he went up there and uh, got the sheep very easily just by walking up a little glacier to, uh, he was going to use his spotting scope to uh, blast the mountain from up there on that glacier on the uh, high berm. And while he was walking up the glacier, he ran into the big sheep and just shot him, and that's all there was to it. Jack Wilson is revered as one of the all-time experts in bush aviation. Incredible as though it may sound, I understand that you actually landed in a plane on top of Mount Wrangell out here. Well, yeah, a number of times. In fact, I made 69 landings up there over a period of many years altogether for different groups of people. How high is that mountain, for heaven's sake? I think it's 14,100 feet high, something like that. Your takeoff performance obviously suffered because of the reduced power, but uh, what, what kind of a takeoff run was would you experience with that altitude? Well, it was a long one, a very long one, uh, sometimes a mile, something like that. I know I timed it once, I looked very closely at a detailed map and I lost 400 feet of altitude on takeoff. So in other words, I was going downhill and it was sticky snow, it still took that long to get off. Oh, for heaven's sake. But it wasn't dangerous because there was a world room up there. As long as you knew where you were pointed and you weren't going to go over a cliff, why you could just head her downhill and away you went. Let her rip, huh? Yep, that was the way it went. No one had ever been in some of these valleys before, and I'd never landed in an airplane. And I wanted to get in there, so, uh, well, one time, for example, I uh, dropped a man off on floats on a lake, and uh, he walked 16 miles to get into a place where I wanted to go. And I went up there and dropped, uh, airdrop food to him and tools from the air. And he just, he just built me a strip, and then I landed and practically cracked up. And, uh, We're not talking about the Fairbanks and, International here, then. The and strip, then no, not really. But then we improved the strip so I could take off, and th then we had it. And another time, I, uh, I landed on another strip that I already had in use, and I had a man, an old prospector, a good man, though, I had him walk down, way down the mountain to another valley and across the ridge, and uh, again I dropped tools and he built a strip, and then I flew a wheelbarrow into that one, tied right on the wing, a big wheelbarrow. <laughs> and we uh, really worked that one over, and we made a pretty good strip out of it. In fact, uh, I had a few uh, people land in there with 180s. I didn't really want them in there, but we made such a strip that uh, they could get in there too, and they kind of took some of the game. But that's all right, we had our airstrip. Kind of a case of what we're doing in that last instance, then, I yeah. guess. A little too much of an improvement job. A little too much of a good thing we did that time. One of the things that you're noted for, I think, is uh, as regards your use of the Super Cup around here was uh, the distinct lack of any modifications. Uh, there's a lot of modifications in some of these cubs we've seen here at the Gulcan Air Show the last couple of days, but uh, your modifications were pretty, pretty moderate. Uh, and uh, just a couple of little things involved. Let's, let's tell the folks uh, about what you, how you approach that end of the mm. flying business. Well, I didn't ever have any wing modifications. I never did go to the uh, stole kits or anything like that. The modification I had was a full IFR panel that I had installed right by the factory in uh, 1960 when I ordered the airplane so that I could fly on instruments and get somewhere in bad weather. 
And then, of course, I had the wheel skis. And the, uh, for summer, on wheels alone, I had the big donut tires, the same as they have nowadays, they're almost the same. And that's all the modifications I ever had on the airplane. And I never had any wing modifications at all. Yet I got everywhere that everybody else did, and uh, the airplane did a fine job. Characteristic humbleness marks the demeanor of Jack Wilson. He is retired, but yet stands tall amongst the ranks of true bush pilots due to his background, skill, and professionalism, which were probably unparalleled during his active years. Wherever bush pilots meet, in hangars or on ramps across Alaska, the name Jack Wilson is often invoked in the talk terms to superlative flying skills. He's a world-famous hunter, guide, and outfitter, but foremost, a bush pilot who is second to none. When it comes to flying the bush, with nearly 40 years of experience, a straddle the stick of his modified Super Cub, Bill Ellis has flown literally thousands of miles and logged thousands of hours in some of the worst flying conditions the continent has to offer. If living legends really exist anywhere, they exist at Devil's Mountain Lodge in the Wrangell Mountains in South Central Alaska. Bill Ellis is indeed a true living legend. This is what we call Devil's Mountain. <laughs> Bill, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, show us this magnificent trophy room, which obviously represents a lot of years' effort on the part of you and your family, bringing all these great trophies together in one place. Uh, and also for giving us a little bit of your time to talk to us about bush flying and super cubs in general. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, we, we're quite proud of it. It represents a, a lot of the family's time and, you know, and it's... That's a wonderful place. Yeah, you know, we, we really enjoy it and I'm sure glad you enjoyed it and I understand that you're here to talk to me a little bit about super cubs and right. flying. And right. I'm full of that. You know, Pretty good topic, don't you think? You betcha. And all we can do is we can go over to the house where it would be more comfortable. It's snowing like heck out there anyway. Okay, about let's that? go on over. Great. Mm -hmm. His journeys have ranged from Point Barrow and beyond, from the Arctic Ice Pack to the Wrangell Mountains, on to southeastern Alaska's rugged coastal environs. But uh, the Arctic, I flew quite a few years in the Arctic. How, how many country. years up there, Ben? Uh, oh, I guess I can safely say I flew 14 seasons up there, I guess. I didn't really count that one up either. You're in the Brooks Range, I understand? Oh, I hunted the Brooks Range quite extensively in the old days when we had our long seasons, you know. We're getting choked down now. It's uh, the Brooks Range sheep season is the same as ours now, and so it used to be earlier. Oh, we I see. used to used to go up there for a short run there. But, uh, what was about the toughest flying? Would you, the Arctic? Does that qualify maybe as the toughest? You well, in the early days, uh, see, there wasn't too many weather reporting places. And uh, and there's no such thing as your DMEs, you know. We had some ADFs, but uh, the ADFs weren't as sophisticated as they are now. And uh, it's it was a different deal, you know what I mean? We tried to to fly as much contact as we could, and that's one thing that we do and i want to stress for the importance of of learning your country uh, which will save your life and especially in the super cub because you know uh, it's well a super cub can be flown on instruments and there's some individuals that are that are proficient at it but my idea is in the mountains to uh, never go on instruments uh, because it's Real easy to get drift or get this or that and you have a problem. So what I've drilled to my boys there and myself, and I think something that's maybe contributed to my longevity just a little bit, oh, is sure. what you do is you learn the routes low level. You see a lot of people that fly from point A to point B and they do it at five or six thousand feet. Right. Okay, if they get in a difficult situation and they try to fly it at three or four hundred feet. Yeah. They don't know the land. Yeah, you can't pick up those checkpoints. Okay, right. if you're, even though you don't have, you have, you're, you've got a problem, you're trying to get home, you have no place to land, even if your visibility drops down to a mile or even less, if you have flown this continually, 
at two or three hundred feet. If you see one rock or one malformed lake or one dead tree, yeah. you know you know exactly where you are. Well, that makes all kinds of sense. And you just you keep pushing it that way, and you can. But and a lot of people say, well, this guy's crazy. You know, he takes all kinds of chances. No, it's a matter of knowing where you're at. You know? That's the key to it in these mountains. Yeah, and you you keep keep your visibility, and then. Like, for instance, you know, if you hang with it a little while, why, there's a place coming up that you can get this thing in. There's a lot of icing conditions a lot of time. Well, a cub will take ice, and they will fly with a certain amount. But I have been iced really bad sometimes, and I didn't think the darn thing was going to fly with that much, but I never did know how much was too much. Oh, that's you know what I mean? And it really worried me. Hope you never uh, had to find out. <laughs> you, know, you bet you. So what we do, like in the mountains here, if we take off, like today, today would be a beautiful day for it. You uh, take off out there and you, you start down the valley here. You start collecting ice. See? Right. Well, you watch your leading edges very closely. And it'll collect a little bit on the leading edge. And what's beautiful and you really breathe a sigh of relief is the little drops that start running around the leading edge because you know it's not going to stick. Oh. But when the little drops stop, that's bad. You think about getting out of there. Yeah. You know, go home to mama. Put it out. <laughs> go home where it's warm. Go home where it's warm. You betcha. During these many years and miles, Bill Allis has developed flying techniques that allow him to push the Super Cub to its ultimate capabilities and still retain a margin of safety required for a long and happy life as one of Alaska's true legends. You try to be a professional, you know, as, as you go, and you want people to take note. A little highlight that I might mention to you is, is one time I taxied down the gas up and I was pre-flighting the airplane and the client come out and brought his gear and everything and he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm looking the airplane over. I'm looking at the ailerons and elevators and going around popping wires like we always do, oh, you know, sure. kick a tire or two and whatever. And he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm pre-flight an airplane, you know, see if anything's going to fall off or something, you know. Right. And, uh, he said, boy, he said, you really do uh, believe in taking care of me, don't you? And I said, no, I don't really care about you. It's me I'm crazy about. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, that's right. And he looked like he was sort of hurt, you know, and I said, but you got to realize if I make it, you're only two feet behind me, there's a good chance you might. <laughs> Bill, uh, getting back for a minute, if we can, to that conversation we had earlier about low and slow uh, contact flying and weather. Uh, specifically, uh, what are you talking about there? Well, what we're talking about is, is getting your aircraft slowed up and trying to get somewhere to where you can get it back again and safely. And what you're also trying to do is to remain in contact with the ground because in mountains you there's no place to get you down so you have to maintain contact you know mm -hmm. and it's a lot according to your aircraft if you're familiar with your aircraft you know pretty well what minimal controllable airspeed is and you can basically like super cub uh, if you <clears throat> They're fairly low to the ground. You need a little maneuvering room. My 45 is comfortable like in my airplane. But all airplanes are different, you know. And so you can't just pin it down and say, hey, man, do this, you know. There's a possibility that your airspeed might not be accurate. Or load a little heavy. And load it a little heavy. It's according to how you're loaded. And there's lots of contributing factors. And so it's uh, awful difficult to just have a hard, fast rule on where you're going to set this airspeed, you know, and it's all according to your experience and and the aircraft, and it's, it takes a while to obtain this, and, uh... 10, 15 percent, maybe overstall, yeah, something like that. Yeah, something like that, it, it'd be fine, and you, you know, and just so it'll work out, you know what I mean? And, the key to this thing is, be, is knowing, knowing the aircraft, knowing what you're doing. Knowing the aircraft, knowing what you, the aircraft will do, and then also knowing the country, you know. Uh, Along those lines, you know, we've also at dinner last night, we were talking a little bit about uh, making a, a turn at the head of a canyon. And you mentioned that there's a, there's a 
kind of a, a nuance of those turns that most a lot of pilots forget about. You want to cover that a little bit? Well, the only way that I can really ex explain it, you know, uh, is a lot of guys fly into a canyon and uh, then they realize all of a sudden that the airplane is not going to get over this canyon, so they've got to make a turn. And to me, the best way I can explain it in the country boy language is an airplane just doesn't turn like you, you call a turn, you know, in your yeah. car, you know. Right. It always skids. And, uh, oh, that's right. Especially if it's not properly executed, it's even worse. Yeah. And uh, that's adds to the problem. That adds to the problem. Yeah. And uh, it's you know. You're talking about extra margin then, a distance and altitude Absolutely. in that condition, and, and make make allowance for that. Make allowance when you do you know, skid like that coming around. There's another concept that I tried to tell my boys also that uh, that I always tried to stress with them years ago when they was learning to fly is that if you set, and I don't know how to word this exactly, and I'll try to stumble around a little bit, but if you set in the airplane and fly it, you're hunting trouble. You've got to be three or four hundred yards out there. Thinking out ahead, looking yeah, out ahead. You've got to be three or four hundred yeah. yards out there. You can't be sitting in the airplane. You've mm -hmm. got to be three or four hundred yards out there. And if you're there, well, then you're, you you're, stand a lot better chance, you know. You're doing what you ought to be doing for going to be a help pilot, I guess. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, I guess, you know. A lot of these things that, you know, that I say are or things that worked for me. Things from experience, though. Well, that's not the, to say that this thing will work for everybody. You know, differences of opinion is what make horse races. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I don't know, uh, I guess the best way that I'd say is just know your aircraft, know your country, know your capabilities, and above all, try to do it safely. You know, we had a real interesting conversation, uh, too, when you were pointing out the fact that you've got a number of cabins scattered around these mountains here, and a lot of them have strips, or a lot of cases you go in a land where there isn't a strip. But can you kind of cover, let's just say, hypothetically, that we're approaching a ridge somewhere and you want to put it down, or you want to maybe think about landing there maybe more than once, mm -hmm. kind of hundred. What, uh, what are you looking at there? What goes through your mind? Well, what goes through my mind is, uh, first thing I do is, uh, look and see if there's some place that I think there's possible to land an airplane. All right. So then what I do is I slow the airplane up and I make a slow drag and I drag the particular point. Sometimes one, two, three times. And during the process of this, you try to figure out the wind. You try to figure out how rough it is. You also try to pick your touchdowns point. Pick your point. Pick your point, point as you go, you know. And then you set up on it, and then when you set up on it, my advice is when you set up on it and it feels good, the airplane feels good, you feel good, Yeah. it'll work out for you. But if it don't feel good, go someplace else because it's been my experience. It sure enough won't work out. If you're hesitant a little bit, so what you're doing, like maybe I've said before, you're operating your aircraft to its utmost efficiency yourself also. And if you, one of the factors is lacking, and it's a little bit out of sync, maybe. Yeah, it, yeah. it just won't work. You're looking for trouble. You know, and two, I remind you again that uh, we were talking about some of my airports. We, we keep them fairly short, you know. And <laughs> uh, when you get ready to leave, with a, a client or something, you know, why, unbeknownst to him, why, it looks pretty short, so you, you don't say anything, you know. And so what you do is you start your takeoff run, and when you get about halfway down it, why, if the airplane feels real good, responsive and everything, you know it's gonna fly. But you keep it there and you burn it all up right to the end, a little short place, you know. And, Extra margin and, again? Yeah, and then the yeah. client, says, wow, we just barely made it out, you know. Oh, yeah. So, but what you've done is you, you know at halfway down the strip, the airplane is definitely going to fly. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know that another added run, the airplane is going to have that much more forward speed, and it's going to be much more controllable. Uh, it wouldn't be unheard of for you to have an engine failure in this particular oh, deal. And right. then you can aim the thing somewhere. Right. But if you stagger off the ground at minimum controllable airspeed, you can't aim it. You are riding. Yeah, you're, you are the passenger in all the truest sense of the term then. Right.
So I think it's important to to reiterate that anyone watching this show has to realize that you're a fellow with uh, 25,000 plus hours in a Super Cub, 30 some years experience, and the things we're talking about, the fact that you do use this airplane on a daily basis, fly it every day at the peak of your uh, operational technique, day in and day out, puts you in a different category. And we're not advocating anything, we're just pointing out the capabilities of a Super Cub flown by an expert under uh, all kinds of varying conditions. That, was that a pretty fair statement, would you say? Yeah, that's, that's along the lines that I'm thinking of. I'd really uh, hate for somebody to, to go out and try to, you know, duplicate what we've done. And that's not to say that I'm really an expert. I don't feel that I am. I feel that I've done this out of necessity. Yeah, you know, so I mean, this so. you use this to make a living, is that yes, right? Yes, to make a living. And uh, right. you do acquire a lot of experience, you know, uh, like a person driving to work every morning on a, in his vehicle, you know. Yeah, he knows right. the route pretty well, he, he does it well. every day, and, and this is what we do, you know. But before we let you off the hook, uh, I'd like to ask you if you could, we could go out to the airplane with you and take a look at some of the lightning things done to this thing and the modifications and some of the enhancements. Chance we can do that? Oh, sure, we can do that. Uh, Bill yeah, Ellis's right short right landing and takeoff there. techniques have been taught to only a few, including his three sons. The legend will continue. I was out there admiring your cub a little earlier, walking around with you, and I, I, that, you've got that thing stripped down, looks awful light. What does that weigh? Uh, it weighs a little less than a thousand pounds, the way we operate it. When you rebuild it, you try to lighten it up. In other words, you, you don't put a 16-coat butyrate finish on it. And, and we're talking about just ounces there, but what you're trying to do is build an airplane that's lighter, you know. And we remove the starter and the generator, and it's sort of an inconvenience to hand prop it, but uh, shucks, you know, you can get 80 pounds or so out of it. Well, that's half of a person, you know. How much is one runway out there? On the road here? Or on the road. Well, you gonna count the bend down there? Or? Oh, <laughs> that's the least the bend. We'll talk about that straight away. <laughs> oh, we could get seven, 800 feet, you know what I mean? It, that's plenty for a super cut. What's the altitude here at this? Uh, oh, we're near about 2,800 here. Somewhere, it's it's awful hard to tell. And none of the old charts are very accurate, you know. <laughs> Bill, how about telling me what's the story on this hood ornament on this cup? Well, when I was a kid growing up, I seen all the cars and everything that had hood ornaments, you know. But I'd never seen an airplane with a hood ornament. So by golly, I decided that I had to have one. So I put that old girl on there. And uh, now you've seen an airplane with a hood ornament. Well, I sure have. That's the first one, though. <laughs> What's that uh, ornament off of? That's off a of 41 Cadillac. 1941? Mm-hmm. Me and that old girl have seen a lot of clouds. Boy, I'll yeah. bet you have. Yeah. yeah, sure. What do you say we jump on the airplane and take a look at, uh, talk a little bit about some short field takeoffs? Okay, by golly, I'll tell you what works for me. Okay, great. Bill, could you uh, run through some of your short field takeoff procedure in this Cub? What I do is... I roll out in position there and line the aircraft up with the runway and uh, you apply max brakes and uh, let the engine reach its RPM and then you apply max throttle and start your takeoff run. And immediately after the aircraft starts to roll, or maybe a fraction before, I lift the tail up for good forward visibility. I love that forward visibility. It may stop the airplane, slow the airplane and take off a little bit. But usually bush strips are narrow and you want to keep everything in a straight line which you got planned out. That makes sense. And as I might have mentioned before, is a first notch of flaps we always pull because it's handy to you. You don't have to bend down a little guy like me. And, you, and after you've had your throttle applied max, well then you drop down to your flap panel and when you figure the aircraft is ready to leave the ground with enough forward speed to satisfy you while you apply back pressure and full flaps all at once. And when you lift up clear and everything is looking good, why then you start to release a little of the back pressure if you wish. Or it's according to what you got coming up, you know what I mean? You need How much of an obstacle ahead or whatever? Yeah, yeah an obstacle or uh, you're in a hurry to get somewhere or you know what I mean and you go, you know you're gonna have to climb there so you leave in a like I said I'm a lazy pilot you know just what's necessary as wide-ranging a bush pilot as any who ever plied the trade in Alaska Bill Ellis has a lot to say about flying technique and about attention to safety 
He will tell you that safety is his paramount concern whenever he saddles up in his cub. This stance adds to his aura and endorses his credo that flying does not suffer fools. Bill Ellis, one of the world's most accomplished active bush pilots says, and listen closely, think ahead of the airplane. Can you imagine landing a Super Cub on skis at 14,000 feet? How about flying a Cub at 18,500 feet elevation? Is it any wonder that young aviators seek to learn from and follow in the footsteps of a pilot's pilot and true gentleman, Cliff Hudson? A true mentor of many young Alaskan bush pilots, Cliff Hudson came to Alaska in 1948 and since then has made a full-time career out of flying mountain climbers and adventurers to the glaciated flanks of Mount McKinley. I started uh, learning in uh, 1948, and uh, now I'm still learning. Still learning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Long time to be learning. Every day is a new day. Uh, many things, uh, a lot of times you see something different, you know, but uh, some days we don't go flying. We get to sit around and uh, think about it. <laughs> Cliff Hudson epitomizes the fact that high-risk flying is only as dangerous as the pilot makes it. This is a pretty special and uh, most certainly a demanding environment in which you fly. I, I know that uh, I, you've got a couple of 185s out here, and you've been you've never you've never had a, an accident with an airplane that you uh, couldn't fly out, and I think that's remarkable in this type of an environment. How does the Cub itself, being smaller and uh, with, a, with a smaller payload, figure into the overall operation here at, uh, at this flight? Well, I, on, on the Super Cub, uh, a lot of times the guy will say, hey, Cliff, I want to go out on this river and uh, I'm going to borrow it. I want, I want to take a load of stuff up there. And uh, some stuff won't fit in the Super Cub. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll go up there and find a bar that's uh, suitable to land 185 on and uh, or the 206. And, uh, they have to work for a few hours shoveling holes in and moving rocks and brush and stuff like that. It's pretty soon have a pretty good airship in there, capable of handling the larger aircraft without causing any damage, hopefully. Oh, I see. So it's just beneficial for that, and you, it lands a lot shorter than your 185 does, and uh, you'll get out shorter, too. Of course, it weighs a hell of a lot less. Oh, yeah. Half the lot power, too. Half the horsepower. <laughs> half the gas, my dad. Huh? Yeah, there you go, yeah. Half the fuel. Mm -hmm. What about uh, you use it in, on, the, on Mount McKinley itself? Are there any occasions when that comes into play? Oh, yeah, I've used it up there a lot of times for air drops, uh, dropping food supplies and uh, fuel. I guess uh, these air drops are conducted by and large uh, solo, is that correct? How do you, how do you accommodate uh, that Well, there's no problem on, on solo. Uh, like for supplies, I put it in a, well, well, these uh, red onion bags are real nice, really, because they're red in color, and I put a little uh, well, extra tape on it in case it sinks down in the snow, so it's not too far, they can't see the bag, they'll see the tape then. But anyhow, I, I open up the door when I get ready to make my drop and uh, get them lined up on them and making sure it's not going to go over top of a ridge or something or, or hit them. I try to get in you know, close to them without hitting them or hitting the camp. But I, you get in as low as feasible, sometimes not too feasible to drop too low if you've got super strong winds and uh, get a good buffeting, downdraft, stuff like oh, that. Yes. And have to try to use good judgment to get it in reasonably uh, close to them and without damaging the aircraft. Mm -hmm. but so far, I've been successful on you know all my drops without hurting anything or anybody. My guy. Hudson does not take any undue risks, and proof of the pudding is his accident-free safety record, which spans some 44 years of Alaskan flying. Mm -hmm. I uh, I know that uh, the Cub, uh, as, as we all know, a Cub has a very uh, uh, low wing loading and it's. You know, it's subject to bouncing around pretty good in turbulence, and I can't imagine a place in the world that would have any more turbulence than Mount McKinley. Uh, can you give us a little perspective on what, on what uh, you experienced in that the ride in the thermals in that little airplane? Well, you're not always positive uh, about which way she's going to go in there, because uh, sometimes the wind comes from all directions at the same time. Right. In fact, one, one time I was in there, I just went out in a little cub, and I was picking up some people on a one little ridge out not too far from the base camp on McKinley there, 7,200 foot level. But anyhow, I, I started to go across this valley and all of a sudden it looked just like a, a tornado, only it was snow. Yeah. And it looked like, oh, a good thousand feet in the air, just a big circle of snow was trying to come right through, picking it up like that. Whirlwind type. Yeah, a big whirlwind, a huge one, wow. And I just 
pulled on over to the side line about two miles from my pad, and I said, hey, I'm not going to get caught up in that thing. Gosh, no, I guess not. <laughs> I pulled over to the side, went way up around the other, other side of the glacier there, and uh, I landed up there for about, oh, 20 minutes, and well, the wind seemed to go down a little, and I took off down and got my job done anyhow, and I got bounced around a little bit. Uh, that's nothing too uncommon up there. This flawless record is accentuated by the fact that a large percentage of his work has been at the controls of a modified Super Cub, flying to, landing on, and taking off from North America's highest peak, Mount McKinley. Mount McKinley is uh, roughly 20,000 feet, is that correct? Yeah, over. Mm -hmm. I understand uh, from our conversation earlier that you have actually evacuated someone from the slopes of that mountain at the 14,000 foot level, roughly? Well, yes. Yeah, sure. No problem there. Mm -hmm. How what uh, could you give us some detail on that? The, the type of slope and what were the circumstances mm -hmm. of, of, from which that incident evolved? And well, there's, there's a basin up there, uh, 14,200 feet, and uh, uh, it now uh, years ago there weren't so many climbers up through there. It wasn't so bad, but mm -hmm. now it's there's big uh, pits all over. These guys dig up snow slabs and uh, you know make their around their tents and things, keep oh, the wind from the wind off. Sure. It would be darn dangerous driving that stuff nowadays. <laughs> so, but anyhow, and this this time here, this guy, he was uh, he was unconscious and uh, his pulmonary edema, what he oh, had, edema. and mm -hmm. uh, he was gasping every doggone breath. And uh, I, I had my I was at the base camp you know, on the Cahilna, and I found out about it. Which was that way elevation? Uh, Seven thousand. Seven thousand yeah, feet. Seven two there, yeah. Okay. Anyhow. I had my son fly the Super Cub on up to uh, up to there, and I, and I took the Super Cub, went up and landed up there at 14,200 foot level, and uh, I landed and uh, I turned around and I took off going downhill, pretty good shot there. I made uh, two takeoffs there just to smooth it out a little better and uh, you know be certain to uh, get off about a certain point with the person there on board, and it wasn't bad. I got him in there and I got him back down to. 7,000 foot level, and uh, another friend, well, we lived in the, two, uh, in the 185 then, and had a tank of oxygen and uh, got him into Anchorage, uh, feeding him oxygen all the way down. He didn't regain consciousness at all. And, uh, didn't know a thing about this rescue. Oh, no. But two days later, he called, uh, called me from the phone from Anchorage in the hospital and said, I hear you got me off that damn mountain. <laughs> I, I guess so. <laughs> That's the first he heard about it, huh? Yeah. No remembrance whatsoever. Cliff, I'm intrigued about the possibilities or the the performance uh, of a cub at altitude, uh, particularly in and around Mount McKinley with all that, its own inherent weather patterns. What is the maximum altitude that you've had a your super cub to in that particular environment? Well, one time I was up to 18,500 feet with it, but you didn't feel too good up there. No. <laughs> she was up there anyhow. Was control a little sloppy at that altitude? Well, yeah, you bet. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, well, I had control of it as far as that goes. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Banks and shallow banks, I think, yeah, was still within the realm of possibility. Oh, shallow banks, yes, indeed. <laughs> you wouldn't want to... Crank any, it around. Any sharp turns up there, you know? <laughs> yeah, Obviously, I, you're on oxygen I at this time. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I usually go on all... Oh, Depends. If I'm by myself, and I say, well, passengers are going to be out at 12,000 feet for, you know, continuous anyhow. But, uh, I see. You can go to 14,000 without it for a short time. You know, I've been up to 16 without it a few times, but uh, you get kind of acclimated to it. Why, that's one thing. That just uh, a lot of people go from down here up to, like, a, a scenic flight around the summit right. up there, over mm -hmm. 20,000 feet, and, and they didn't have oxygen until they go to sleep. Real easy, fast. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. I've been through an altitude chamber. I, I, I'm familiar <coughs> with that strange feeling. Yeah. Does it cover anything left at 18,000 feet, or is there anything? No, you, yeah, have to you have to reserve. You have to reserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Right at the end of its rope. Yep. Mm -hmm. not, uh, not much performance, I wouldn't think, with it. Even though it's a 150 no, horse it's engine, that must be pretty mm -hmm. substantially diminished at that mm -hmm. altitude. Yeah, I might have 65 out of it. <laughs> yeah, out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, don't it don't perform near as good. The uh, engine turns up pretty fair. You just don't. Don't uh, pull it down, you know. It'd be nice to have one of the triple charger on. Well, <laughs> I, after all these years, I think, you, as you indicated, you've been flying since 48, uh, bought that airplane in 56. Mm -hmm. Same airplane that's sitting out here through this window. Uh, obviously, you must like it. Now, what are your general comments about a Super Cub as an entity into itself, as a Super Cub in relation to other airplanes that you have and have flown? Well, I've, I've flown a lot of uh, light airplanes. Uh, for landing, getting into a short spot and back out and feeling comfortable about it, uh, I think Cub has the best of them beat. Uh, and for what I know, I, I like the Arctic turn. It's, it has a lot of good 
putting good points there. It may work better or not. I don't know. I can't really say. Mm -hmm. but, uh, in comparison, I, I, in your I, I kind of like the cub I do, for what I do, yes. Uh -huh. The mild-mannered individual who greeted us at his hangar in Talkeetna carries the mantle of Mount McKinley's most experienced glacier pilot with all the aplomb and self-effacing presence one might expect from a true gentleman. To truly appreciate the latent capabilities of the Super Cub, one has only to zero in on what experts like Hudson ask of this tough yet frail craft. Face raging winds, climb to and operate at unheard of altitudes, land on crevasse riddled glaciers, all in a day's work. People like Cliff Hudson, who through safe and steady success and flying in and around unimaginably inhospitable terrain, incite awe and admiration. Such a person redefines the meaning of the term professional. Roger Stradley, from his base in Montana, while flying for the U.S. Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and in his own survey and patrol endeavors, has racked up what are probably more logged hours at the controls of a Super Cub than anyone alive. Remarkably, much of this flying headed in the high-risk mountain flying arena. Roger will share some of his experiences as he explains and demonstrates the deadly moose stall, as his Alaskan counterparts have termed it. The following professional dissection and analysis of the potential quirks and suddenness of a low airspeed, low altitude stall spin will be a major contributor to pilot safety. Being the benefactor of your 25,000 hours experience in Super Cubs and then flying through the stall spin sequence we just concluded a few minutes ago, that uh, was really something. Uh, would you mind explaining to us in old instructor's terms just what happened up there? Okay. <clears throat> the airplane, when it um, gets in a certain position and certain uh, controls, the, the airplane tends to... Uh, go completely out of control you might say so what's happening is by overloading a control which on that sequence I was overloading the rudder control in a right hand bank to start with and what happens then is and and when I overloaded the uh, rudder control why the airplane goes inverted and then goes into the spin and uh, of course it's stalled and as long as you continue to hold that or hold any pressure on any of the controls that airplane will continue to, to go on down like that. And of course, uh, like we were this morning, there are times we were losing 1,000 feet at a time. And I was surprised at the altitude loss, right? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a dangerous situation, especially when you're low and slow to the ground, uh, like we are with Super Cubs when we're doing uh, this different kinds of work. And so it, it, it uh, can cause people real trouble. Uh, it's something that uh, people should go through these sequences, and especially acrobatics. So they begin to learn what each control does to each airplane and, and in what uh, circumstance, especially where we were in that real high nose attitude uh, banking condition. I know uh, you've expressed a uh, previously that you're a big advocate of uh, any professional pilot or anybody who takes flying seriously to get uh, a certain amount of aerobatics under his belt. That's right. Now, if, they, if they're going to be a professional pilot uh, where you're going to be in the these different situations and, and stuff, uh, especially in mountainous terrain and even in the flylands where you're working with an airplane and and you're picking the airplane up and, and making the turns with it and, and stuff like that. Why, if you understand each control and what each control does to the airplane, why, then you're going to be a whole lot for air uh, pilot. And of course, each airplane, uh, is rigged different, so right individual just, in idiosyncrasies that's of each right. aircraft. So each airplane that you fly, you just about have to to realize that uh, that the, uh, the airplane's going to act a little different than the other one you're in. So as you go uh, working with the different airplanes, a person has to almost uh, test out each airplane so that you know if if you go into a stall sequence like that, that one wing isn't going to drop out quicker than the other, or it's going to do like it normally should, where if the, like we were this morning where we had the high wing come and bringing us over the top. 
literally went over the top. That's right. And inverted, basically. That's right, lady. And the thing is, is, once it gets in that position inverted, then then as you bring it through, that it's, it's going to give you another stall, and then that spin just continues to tighten. Well, I was amazed. I, I think uh, you alluded to the interesting analogy that there's a fence post on the ground. The way that thing was winding up, we probably could have hit it. That's right. No, in other words, once the Super Cub starts and it really gets into it and you're holding it there, of course, I was, I was aggravating it by holding it there, but once it tightens that spin up, it, it, uh, it just uh, straight down spirals all. It's, it's just really tight, and it is, it's vertical. A real corkscrew. A real corkscrew. It's really vertical. And, okay. and to say each airplane is going to be a little different. And of course, then if you're, if you're in that situation and you're holding power, which most people wouldn't, they'd know enough to get the power out of it. Right. But of course, then, then usually the left hand is, is tighter because the power is pulling it down. But uh, as I say, most people are just a normal reaction when things happen that quick and that violent, the power comes off. And of course, the airplane is, then is returned to, to level, level wing level flight as quick as you can because then that's that gives you the most stable position but even as you're going straight down you've got to me realize that that airplane is turning one way or the other and you've got to stop that rotation and get those wings level so that you're pulling the airplane straight back up through and not in a turn because that can aggravate the situation again well the actual consequences of this is the fact that it, no matter what it does take a certain amount of altitude to recover from a situation like what we're in this morning and uh, you want to make sure you don't get yourself in a situation, cross-controlled situation, go to the ground where you don't have that, that uh, safety margin. That safety margin of altitude, that's right. So, uh, but as, as I say, so when, you, when you're working the airplane and doing this, and you, and you go out and, and you try this in your particular airplane, then the thing uh, to do is, is to realize that when you got one control out of coordination a little bit, you get this feeling out of the airplane, and, and so that you recognize it quick enough that you don't aggravate it and go on into the situation. Well, that was, I think that's an interesting point because one of the things that, that really uh, astounded me this, this morning was the fact that there really was no uh, anticipation of a stall. There was no shuddering, not a thing. I think you were holding top rudder. What else was happening? But we went boom, just like yeah. that. So what I was doing there was I was, I was bringing the nose higher and, and, and then... In a turn. In a turn. Right. So then when the... The, I had it high enough so that when it did, when the when the layer of air separated off the wing, it was immediate, and then the airplane would pitch and roll at the same time. So, in other words, where I was aggravating the situation, where in a normal working day maybe you wouldn't aggravate it that bad, but it's nice to aggravate that to see, to get to know that it, it will break that claim that there is no warning. And how it's sudden. And how sudden it does do Indeed. it, and then when you're in that situation and you start feeling that airplane doing something it shouldn't, you know that you've, you've pushed it far enough. Uh, to kind of conclude this uh, little talk of ours, would you say it's probably a good idea for uh, Cub pilots everywhere not to go out and, and try this on their own, but to get some good, uh, some good instruction on the procedures involved before they attempt to do some of these things we did this morning? That's right. In other words, if anybody that, that has not done acrobatics should go have a a certified instructor in acrobatics with an airplane that is stressed for it so they can make mistakes and right. still come out the bottom end of it and have him show them what they're doing and how they're coordinating in these uh, where you're putting the airplane to its maximum performance right. and then then that way when you do put that airplane to that maximum performance you realize that when you put a control just a little bit out of coordination you get that sensation you get that feel that he's trained you in and you immediately get it back into where it's in level or, or level or flight, so you're actually recovering before that gets into that far situation, into that bad of situation. The ultimate upshot then being we we're hoping we'll make uh, smoother and safer Cub pilots across the country. That's right, safer Cub pilots, so they don't have that trouble low to the ground. Great. For all its utility and performance, along with generally benign flight characteristics, the Super Cub, like every other airplane in the sky, is not impervious to the inflexible laws of aerodynamics. When operating a Super Cub, the key is to avoid stalling it. To not stall it seems simple enough, but further explanation is in order to expand upon the image of the straight-ahead power-off stall of a lightly loaded airplane remembered from primary training. 
The pilot needs to be prepared for an aircraft with substantially different characteristics when that same airplane is operated in gusty conditions or in a steep bank or heavily loaded with a stall possibility enhanced by aft center of gravity. There is nothing inherently characteristic to a Super Cub that would give it a greater tendency than any other aircraft to stall and spin. All spins in all airplanes are preceded by a stall on at least a part of a wing. The Super Cub, because of the way it is utilized, often low and slow in various configurations, needs to be dealt with prudently. Special attention must be given to rudder input to ensure that all maneuvers are coordinated. The moose stall, as it is termed, and which we will discuss in detail, has been the cause of fatalities, not only in the Super Cub, but in other aircraft as well. Again, the laws of aerodynamics are irrefutable. A stall is a loss of lift and increase in drag that occurs when an aircraft is flown at an angle of attack greater than the angle for maximum lift. Nine terms apply to the discussion of stalls and their resulting spins. In actual flight situations, their causes and effects are interrelated. Angle of attack is the angle at which the wing meets the relative wind. A change in the angle of attack will affect the amount of lift that is produced. An excessive angle of attack will eventually disrupt the flow of air over the airfoil. Exceeding the critical angle of attack for a particular airfoil section will always result in a stall. Air speeds are controlled primarily by the elevator. If an airplane's speed is too slow, the angle of attack required for flight will be so great that the air can no longer follow the upper curvature of the wing. The result is boundary layer separation. Putting the following elements together, the separation of airflow from the wing, loss of lift, a large increase in drag, will eventually result in a stall if the angle of attack is not reduced. A stall is the result of excessive angle of attack, not airspeed. A stall can occur at any airspeed, any altitude, and at any power setting. Configuration. Flaps can affect an airplane's stalling speed. Generally, extending flaps on a Super Cub will increase the wing's lifting capabilities while reducing the airplane's stall speed. Load factor G-loads. An aircraft's stall speed increases in proportion to the square root of the load factor. Example, an airplane that stalls at 40 knots can be made to stall at 80 knots when subjected to a load factor of 4 Gs. In a constant rate turn, increased load factors will cause an airplane stall speed to increase as the angle of attack increases. Excessively steep banks should be avoided because the airplane will stall at a much higher speed. CG, center of gravity. The CG location has an indirect effect on the effective lift and angle of attack of the wing, the amount and direction of the force on the tail and the degree of stability and deflection needed to supply the proper tail force for equilibrium. Weight. As the weight of the airplane increases, the stall speed increases. Also, the increased weight requires a higher angle of attack to produce additional lift to support the weight. Altitude and temperature. While altitude has little or no effect on an airplane's indicated stall speed, thinner air at higher altitudes will result in decreased aircraft performance and a higher true airspeed for a given indicated airspeed. Snow, ice, or frost on wings. Obviously, such conditions increase drag and decrease lift. Do not attempt flight when these accumulations contaminate aircraft surfaces. Turbulence can cause an aircraft to stall at significantly higher airspeeds than in a stable condition. A vertical gust or wind shear can cause a sudden change in the relative wind and result in an abrupt increase in the angle of attack. 
perhaps increasing to a critical degree and precipitating a stall. A Super Cub incorporates in its design a rectangular wing plan form, which gives a predictable stall pattern. In a power off stall, airflow separates at the wing root first. Wind spilling off the wing root hits the fuselage and tail section, giving aerodynamic buffet a good stall warning. As the stall progresses outward, it is possible to keep aileron control or lateral control longer. Do not use aileron control too long, however. Fall back on rudder inputs as aileron control may aggravate the stall. In a power on stall, slipstream from the prop may delay separation of airflow at the wing root. Therefore, a pilot may lose aileron control much sooner and not receive the aerodynamic warning of a power off stall. Consider then the elements of the hair raising moose stall, a power on stall which usually takes place close to the ground and is followed every time by a violent spin. A spin is defined as a maneuver in which the airplane descends in a helical path while flying at an angle of attack greater than the angle of maximum lift. Spins result from an aggravated stall, either a slip or a skip, which is an uncoordinated maneuver. Consequently, if a stall does not occur, a spin cannot occur. The primary cause of an inadvertent spin is exceeding the critical angle of attack for a given stall speed while executing a turn with either excessive rudder and insufficient aileron or vice versa. The pilot may not even be aware that a critical angle of attack has been exceeded. When the angle of attack is exceeded while cross-controlling the aircraft, it usually results in a rotation in the direction of the rudder being applied, regardless of which wingtip is raised. In a skidding turn, where both aileron and rudder are being applied in the same direction, rotation will be in the direction in which the controls are applied. However, in a slipping turn, where the opposing aileron is held against the rudder, the resultant spin will usually occur in the opposite direction of the aileron being applied. Refer again to the moose stall, a risky situation that combines volatile aerodynamic elements. Keep in mind that the laws of aerodynamics are irrefutable as we total up the inherent part of the moose stall discussed earlier. One, a steep, low altitude turn where G loads cause increased stall speed, which can result in inadequate room to recover from the stall spin. Two, a desire for low air speed. The angle of attack becomes so great, air can no longer follow the upper curvature of the wing. Three, aircraft loading. A heavily loaded aircraft, weight increase stall speed increases, and aft CG significantly increases chances of entering a spin after a stall. Four, gusty conditions can stall a Super Cub at a significantly higher airspeed due to sudden changes in relative wind. Five, altitude and temperature. Air density affects engine performance and aerodynamics. Higher true airspeed for a given indicated airspeed. Six, icing. Accumulations increase drag and decrease lift. Note that in viewing objects on the ground, that is the moose, the pilot may be distracted from flying the airplane. Improper airspeed management. Letting the nose get a little too high or letting the aircraft drift into an uncoordinated condition, cross-controlling. An accelerated, aggravated stall may ensue, and bang! Over the top it goes, and into a fully developed spin, unless corrective measures are applied. Corrective measures. One, power off. Two, ailerons neutral. Three, rudder opposite the direction of the spin. 
Four, ease back the elevator to return to level flight in order to maintain altitude. In a Super Cub, at anything less than 400 feet above the ground, there simply will not be enough time to recover from a moose stall. Should the spin break over the top from a cross-controlled maneuver, it will be quite violent. This further reduces the pilot's response time to recognize and implement corrective action. Roger Stradley, his brother Dave, and their father before them have for years constituted a Super Cub focused flying service whose specialty, high risk mountain survey and telemetry work, has elevated them to legendary status among Montana's flying fraternity. No nonsense pre flights and operating modes, and meticulous maintenance are standard operating procedure at this operation. Experts, yes. But they got that way by putting on their thinking pilot's face every time they initiated the takeoff. Again, that old refrain endorsed by Roger, know your aircraft and think. As you can see, we're in the midst of a high-performance sailplane meet at the base of the Mission Mountains near beautiful St. Ignatius, Montana. The tow plane of choice, you guessed it, the good old Super Cub, performing just one more aerial job from its bag of capabilities. I hope you've enjoyed this brief look at Super Cubs, part one. Before long, we'll be back with part two, featuring more flying technique on wheels, skis, and floats, with modifications for both utility and performance, and with aerial adventure from the farthest corners of the world. The super world of the Super Cub. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.